Welcome to Keep Making Movies, the podcast where we explore, shall we say, movies that may have needed a bigger budget. We evaluate the movie for what it is, decide if it could have been improved with a budget, and if it'll join our Keep Making Movies official recommend list. I'm your host, KJ, and with me is... Tom. Today we are discussing Andrew Zed Sakula's Cube 2 Hypercube. This is Sakula's second feature-length film, and... Sakula has been the cinematographer on quite a few movies, including Pulp Fiction. Cube 2 is very similar to the first movie. We follow people who have woken up and are unaware of where they are, why they are here, and they are again in a maze of identical cubed rooms. The cast of characters this time include, but are not limited to, a generic woman, a blind woman, a woman suffering from Alzheimer's, a man with a knife, and Jerry a friendly software engineer that would probably do okay on Jeopardy. They move from cube to cube while an unknown force is trying to kill them, and eventually they realize they're in a 4D maze, and our lead woman makes it out of the maze. In the last few minutes of the movie, it's revealed that she was sent into the maze to recover a device that the blind woman had hanging on her neck, and then she's shot. Dead. Fade to credits. So, Tom, that's, <laughs> what do you think the goals of the creators were with Cube 2? I think the goals of the creators were to take this small concept of a single room type of film and make it more radical, make it cooler, make it hipper, use a few more graphics and all that type of thing. Um, and expand the cube lore, cube lore so it's not just cubed it's it's four dimensions now and isn't that rad and so on and so forth um it actually kind of reminds me a little bit of murder mysteries like agatha christie murder mysteries where wherever mrs marple goes somebody just dies and then she, she has to solve it and it's kind of the same setup um, wherever cube goes a bunch of people for some reason are locked in and they have to solve the cube you know it's just it's a, it's another thing like that and then consequently it also functions kind of like a a horror film franchise right horror film franchises work in the same way we have a cast of somewhat generic characters who are killed off by the monster in this case the cube thing is the monster so if we think of this in terms of the development of a franchise, which is what they do, there's more cube movies after this, then they're creating, I guess what you could say is a horror movie in which the monster is the set, which is right. a mm -hmm. fairly, mm -hmm. I think it's a fairly original thing. I don't know if it's entirely original, completely unique, but, or unique, but that's something to be said for it that you don't see in, in other horror movies. Sure, sure. And especially at first, it feels like it's the way the cubes move in four dimensions that is the threat. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually, it feels more like, no, 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 there's a spinny thing right there. It almost seems, I, I don't know if it's conscious, but it's it's attacking. It's not just full, It's not just the rooms are folding in on themselves and people happen to be in the wrong spot there's at least one scene where it feels like they're being targeted by the cube, the hypercube. Indeed. Yeah. It, it's not entirely sure why the hypercube is targeting them or why it's killing them off. You, you kind of learn that all these people are the enemies of a evil corporation. That seems to be a subcontractor with the military. And so it's this sort of evil corporation, evil military alliance that is the reason why these these people are 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 being put in the cube and killed though it seems to be not a highly expeditious way of getting rid of your enemies but you know fair enough um so there's a little bit of a reasoning there it's not entirely sure why the cube as a thing as a device the tesseract as they call it is doing this or what it what it does right like it's it's kind of hard to figure out the parameters in the first movie the cube is just something that it's a bunch of rooms with death traps that move around and it is just exists there's no we don't know why it exists it just exists and you have to figure out prime number sequences in order to, to map it out 
it's like to map figure out it where out. we are, how to move forward or backwards or whatever way you want to go. Yep. Yeah. In this movie, you don't have that. You have a code, which turns out to just be the time in which the cube is going to fall apart. <laughs> and if you, at the time when the cube is about to fall apart, jump through a hole, which is pretty easy to see, you'll, you'll be okay. You'll Unless survive. somebody shoots in the head. Yeah. Right. Until you get out. Yep. So I think that's the go- that would be my my interpretation of the goals. The goals is the set is the is the monster in this horror film. What about you? Yeah, I know I agree with that. Um, I also think they wanted to up the game a little bit. Um, one of the things I'm glad they didn't up the game with is the gore. Right, the first cube had the guy like uh, his face was like burned out. Um, there was somebody else who exploded. In this one, there is some blood. Like the one guy gets chopped up. Right, there is some gore, but it. I'm glad they didn't just be like, oh, now this is going to be the gory cube. Um, the, the figuring out how to get through the maze is more of a challenge and turns out it's impossible. So like that is another way they raise the bar. I think um, the touch to open doors was, uh, I, I imagine the actors from the last one were like, I'm so tired of opening these doors. I just don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so the solution might have been to have the the touch doors instead of, um, <laughs> bad cgi touch doors <laughs> yes um the gravity changing between rooms right that was kind of a cool effect um i don't doesn't know do it, anything though right it doesn't help the plot at all <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't it's not a threat it's not it's just one thing that Another, happens and right. then they move on yeah yeah um but it is it's also fun the way they shot that almost worked you know what i mean like it gave you something else to look at while you were watching cube mm-hmm. Um, and then introducing the time travel piece, right? So they see themselves sometimes, um, and I guess it's not just time travel, it's also multiverse. Mm -hmm. So I think they wanted to take what Cube had and introduce some more elevated ideas. And here's some of the examples I think that they included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. The problems with those things is that the, the multiple universe stuff does nothing as a particular threat into itself right it would have been cool if they handed themselves something or Mm -hmm. right the the coolest you get is when um the guy with the knife we see him again he has gray hair so it suggests he's been there a while but he's also he has tons of um the badges of the one person that he must have killed over and over and over again he had a bunch of watches from another guy he must have killed over and over so they kind of play with it there a little bit yeah yeah, I suppose in that, but even that does nothing really for the plot other than actually lower the stakes, right? Because the, those guys those, and that gal, apparently they're still alive somewhere in the cube. And so their death isn't as much of a threat. And also his actions are kind of strange. We're not entirely sure why is he killing these people other than he can. Uh, when he's threatening the old woman, he's trying to get information out of her. He thinks she's, she's um, playing, playing silly that she's actually not um, suffering from Alzheimer's kind of memory or, loss. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's just, just, she's so there's a reason why he's violent with her, but with the other people, he's just sort of violent because he, he can be, he wants to be this movie requires someone to be a bully because the first movie also had a bully. Uh, so it, it ends up becoming, um, kind of not that interesting or not that threatening in part because his actions have no reason behind them and in part it it matters less because there's just an infinite amount of that woman who's who's running around and running around yeah um and he also turns off his bullying when that's required for the plot (laughs) right it's also it he he amps it up when he gets frustrated or mad or we need tension and he kind of turns it off when, no, no, we got to work together for a few minutes here to get to the next room <laughs> or figure out the next. Yeah. Bit. So. You're not entirely sure why he goes crazy. And there's scenes too where like, the blonde woman goes to run away from him and he just kind of stands there and doesn't chase after her, but kind of yells. <laughs> so you're not, <laughs> you're not entirely here. sure. Yeah, you're not entirely sure why he doesn't do that. I mean, his, his actions seem not to have any kind of weight on the overall plot no, unfortunately very few people's actions seem to have weight on the overall plot the overall plot yeah yeah and we're kind of talking about it but how do you think they did with the money they had 
Well, they had more money than the first one. We don't know exactly know how much more, but they had more money than the first one. And I think they did less well with it than the first one. They substituted visual things that were visually, I wouldn't say the first cube is visually interesting, but it's more visually interesting than this. And they try to make it more visually interesting by adding CGI, a rotating shape that kills people, um, crystal things that come out of the kind of slice up the room a little bit slice like up, the room. up the room i don't know yeah <laughs> or kind of burn the bodies or something it's like i'm not entirely yeah, yeah it's, it's a little <laughs> unclear as to how this thing hurts people and then there's the cgi ending which is a marvel of <laughs> animation <laughs> well even the opening credits had cg mm -hmm. um so the first movie was 1997 so i imagine any cg in there was probably pretty expensive right windows 98 isn't out yet they're whatever they're working with is some pretty old computers mm -hmm. whereas this is 2003 so windows xp is out we're, we're way further like that, that was a big jump in at least consumer electronics um and in the opening credits they are drawing the cubes at what looks like on like a blueprint style format and then we get a fade from those drawn plans into the actual filmed white room and it all lines up which suggests they've created that white room in cg as well so they could use the actual room or they could use the cg counterpart for when they needed it i imagine a lot of the special effects like the walls coming out and stuff were <laughs> easier to blend because they had the c the, the whole see. set was also in cg and in um in practical in in the in real life mm -hmm. Okay, so they can merge the practical and the, and the computer right. graphics much easier. Okay. But I think that hurt it. I think that hurt it a lot, like you're saying. Um, I, the doors, they just... <sighs> the doors open... Uh, the doors are CGI audience, so when you just kind of hold your hand in front of them, um, you know, like you're going in and out of a supermarket or something, and they open up, but they look really bad. <laughs> yeah. And and that threatening force, whenever it showed up, you just it it took me out of the movie because you knew it it wasn't you knew it wasn't there. It just <laughs> it was... it's a bit ambiguous as to what it is or what it does. I mean, it seems to smush people or rip body parts off of them uh, or something. I I mean, and it, we're not entirely sure what it is either. Is it the universe changing, collapsing that? In 4D, this happens sometimes, and since we're 3D, we get smushed by it, right? You fold paper, and there's an ant on there. Whoops. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no real... And and you don't know when it's coming, either. Right. Every so often, the blind woman will be like, I think it's coming, to like try mm -hmm. to build some tension. But... And she's sometimes wrong. <laughs> sometimes true. it doesn't happen. <laughs> Um, but one thing I thought they did really well is every time they entered a new room, how it was shot made me want to see what was in the new room. They did a pretty good job of focusing on the characters, the characters looking at something. And I'm like, oh, I want to see what's in this room. And they did that a lot. And I thought that worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. I don't remember in the original Cube having that same... Right in the original Cube, a lot of the rooms were booby-trapped and I had to throw the boot. So I was almost afraid to see what was in the room. These, it was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to introduce something. Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. always introduce something, but... Yeah, you see curious. them focused on their faces more so, and then... Yeah, I suppose that's, that's nice. It creates kind of anticipation. Um, there was never really a lot in the rooms, though. No. That's... Right. <laughs> yes. And then the nice thing about having not having an invisible threat, but you know possibly a room could be booby trapped or possibly not, is that you that it really heightens the the tension there. If there's just kind of rando things in rooms, it's it doesn't really heighten the tension, especially since some of the things you're looking for are either a reflection of them in a past or an alternate version of them, a past version or an alternate version of them, or or what have you, which the, the alternate versions of them, except for the guy with the knife, aren't, aren't really threatening. Very often, sometimes they're just corpses. Um, 
Right. My, my favorite one was when they were all dead in one room. Yeah. And originally, I thought they were dolls. I thought some like the room had somehow made fake dolls, or somebody of the group had made dolls of everyone. And I thought, well, that's so funny and weird. I really like that. How like the, some of the stuff is kind of creepy, random. But no, they're supposed to be dead. Supposed <laughs> that's to be actually... dead. Which so now you gotta think about it. They all decided, well, this is the room we're just gonna lay down in and die. Mm-hmm. Right. Unless because they didn't get cut up, they didn't look smushed. They looked like they died of natural causes. Mm-hmm. All sitting but, together, in kumbaya. Yeah, and clean clothes. Right. Not, <laughs> yeah. So I suppose that was it. Another thing that drove me nuts is the camera spun a lot, mm-hmm. and I forget. There's one scene where the guy with the knife is making a big speech, and the camera's just spinning around him and around him and around him and around him. And I'm like, man, if they don't stop doing this soon, I I gotta skip or something. Like I can't take <laughs> this spinning anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a little that that's a little annoying. And they they do that with to indicate a sort of the the potential that the gravity is going to work differently in different rooms. But very often the camera kind of tilts downward or to the side or something like that and the, it does nothing to the the gravity. It's just he's spinning his camera around for whatever reason. They also will sometimes leave the camera there and fade people in and out to show that they're traversing through cubes. Mm-hmm. But that kind of breaks the illusion, right? Because we know as the audience, there's only one cube. But in, in the first cube movie, they never do that. They want to make sure you absolutely think they're moving from cube to cube. Here, since I know it's the same cube, but I'm trying to get into the movie. But then they're like, well, you know, we just had the people walking around and we're just showing you that instead of them going through the doors. Mm-hmm. It's like they don't even want to admit that there's only, like that there might be a chance if there's more than one cube. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did get the first four-dimensional sex scene in a movie. I'm assuming. We did. I, I, I'm, it apparently looks like anti-gravity sex, which I don't know if we've had that in a movie before. Ah, uh, that, I wonder, did they do that in um, Passengers with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence? We did that on Talking Pictures Trivia. We um, did. That was 2016. I was going right? to say, that would be after this, so maybe that was inspired by... Mm-hmm. And that was yeah. But they also gravity. have gravity. Um, that ship has gravity in it, don't they? It does. So maybe I'm mixing it up because she's in the pool at one point. The gravity turns off and she's going to drown. Oh, that's right. And the, the but pool. I didn't know if they also there was a room or something. I'm trying to remember, but that wasn't necessarily 4D. I think this might have been 4D, not 4D just gravity. And sex. Oh yeah, this is 4. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> yeah, also a completely incomprehensible scene that does nothing for the plot or the characters. You, these people end up having sex, I guess, because it's like, well, we're going to die, so we might as well have sex. But it doesn't tell you really much about them as people. It does nothing for the plot. They just end no. up. They they kind of die, right? When we see them. Well, we see another. Like I don't know if it was in the same corpse room, but in another corpse room, we see them intertwined mm-hmm. like Pompeii or something, still spinning around. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's how they went. Maybe we just weren't made for 4D intercourse. Um, well, they did build it up a little bit. Um, the guy's name was Max, and as soon as he saw the girl in the red dress, he was like, oh, the ratings of this show just went up. Mm-hmm. So like that kind of showed, but her, nothing, and then all of a sudden it was like, Let's do it. And it doesn't matter. That's also the thing. It doesn't, the fact that he's a little, that she's like the sexy woman in this and he's kind of into her. The fact that that ends up in a a sexual act doesn't, it doesn't do anything for the plot. It doesn't tell us really much about these characters. It's a way of, I imagine getting what he must have thought of as a cool shot having these people floating around and the red dress kind of coming undone and wrapping around them and all, you know, all this crap. And, um, so yeah, sorry, but, <laughs> but I, I think that's what he was going for. This kind of aesthetic look, which is supposed to be what I think is the best thing in horror movies, which is beautiful nightmare, right? Something beautiful. That is also an indication of, of a horror, right? What you might call the sublime. Um, but in order to do that, either you have to connect it to the plot in some way, right? It, it advances the plot. Um, it's not just a random visual, but it, it's connected to the plot. Or it 
collides with the visual aesthetic up to that point, therefore creating discomfort. David Lynch does this all the time, where you'll see something that is just inexplicable in the midst of of this chaos, and that builds the tension. In this, we have a physical explanation of the sex. We have no characterological explanation. And the visual isn't that intriguing, mostly because we know we can get an explanation of it. And then it doesn't do anything in the plot. It doesn't raise the stakes. It doesn't lower the stakes. Apparently, they die doing this somehow. That's never explained other than hand wave in quantum physics, which it's fine to hand wave in science fiction or in, in speculative fiction in order to establish rules that we can then follow to do something. If your hand waving is anything can happen, but, oh, I guess time works differently here, so now they're dead, then all it does is suck out the energy from a movie. There's no waiting for anything because anything can happen because time is different here. And so it just becomes kind of dull it becomes a very dull experience well as i say i think this is the first 4d sex scene so maybe in the future somebody will <laughs> take you know take the torch and keep running right? like, keep we're, going we're, yeah. we're, we're criticizing it pretty harshly but it's the first one maybe I don't yeah know. that's true <laughs> it's true you know another thing i was thinking because there's no color in the cube it's all white editing this must have been a nightmare Right, you better have kept that footage very well organized and very well labeled. Because otherwise, if you had to go find a shot that you kind of remember happened, it all's going to look the same. You're going to have to watch all the footage again, right? The movie must have had impressive paperwork. We can say that about this film. Documentation behind documentation yeah. behind Cube Two. I would love to see that actually. Must be Excelsior. Yeah. <laughs> I, seriously to keep it all straight like yeah and especially since most of the things they do are not consequential they could almost happen in any order they could almost it's 4d it's a hyper like yeah i mean you need to introduce the characters first so you need this stuff in the beginning where the the happy engineer explains things and you need them to introduce alex what's the last name the there's a uh, a secret conspiracy super genius guy oh, yeah. who m one character thinks might be responsible for the hypercube, Alex something or other, Alex Traverse or something like that. Um, you need to introduce that in the beginning as a potential explanation because that gun is later fired. And we could talk about that and <laughs> how uninspired that was uh, if we want. So Alex ends up being... The, the blind, the blind woman. girl, Sasha. Yep. Yeah, Sasha. So Alexandria, I suppose, is her first is, is her first name, and she uh, she's apparently designed part of the cube. Can we work through this plot? They all had something to do with the cube, and I I'm pretty sure she did like software simulation or something on the four D ness. So without her research, they couldn't have even started to build it. But she had nothing to do with the actual building. Yeah, she she didn't want it. But they were going after her because she had something. Something around her neck, right? Either a USB stick, some data. Something like that. And so she wanted to hide for them. So she hid from them in the only place she knew. The hypercube. The hypercube. And somehow this version of people were the right version to get that correct USB stick, right? Because presumably there's a bunch of Sasha's in there too, no? I suppose so. And I guess we know the woman who is the lead, who is not Sasha. Her name is... Kate. Kate. Kate Can I tell you my favorite Kate line? Sure. God, you know, I wish I was just smarter. That was my like you would have been able to... I almost texted you that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, apparently, the idea is so. Whatever. So, so Sasha has something around her neck, and the whole purpose of Cube Two Hypercube, depending on what ending you get, there's two endings oh. which we can talk about. Yeah, I didn't um, know that. There is two endings. We could talk about it, but in the first ending, Kate is just killed. So Kate, you find, is like. An operative, she was there to get the thing from around Sasha's neck, and so they just kill her. That's the whole point. In the other version, 
Kate comes back and they explain more. They still shoot her in the head for some reason, but we learn that Kate is the most successful operative that's ever gone in there. Um, that she's only been in there for six minutes and 59 seconds. That's how long she's been in there, which is also the time signature when the cube dissolves. And I think she's the first one to survive. She's the first one ever to survive. And so for some reason, they then kill her anyway, despite, despite these things. And how do they know she's the best operative if this is the first one to survive? Because I guess survival is the, the thing that gets you to survive. I, I, it's a little confusing because I guess she's the best because she survived. But the reason they sent her in there was to get the, the USB port or the, whatever the thing is around Sasha's neck, which in the past, I guess, hasn't worked. So it keeps getting destroyed and remade when the cube returns it, it the, the pieces don't exactly line up <laughs> but there are two endings because oh, there's an so infinity I, I watched the one with all that explanation oh really okay yeah, yeah. Um, okay the, the prime video one that i i don't know if they're both on there but the one i clicked on um in the end said yep you were in there for six minutes bah, 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 and then poof. oh the other one they just shoot her hmm. they just yeah well, what do you think, Tom? Do you think a budget would have helped this movie? Um, no. I, the The problem with what would you do with the budget that the, again, it kind of comes down to the the script, right? You need better stakes. You need a better puzzle. I mean, the first one puzzle is kind of a little silly with prime numbers, but whatever. There's a way of getting out, and you can see these characters how they could get out and what's preventing them from getting out. And so then when obstacles come in their way, it gets you frustrated because you want the obstacles to go away. In this, it's, they have no idea how to get out of there. There's no clue. Um, yeah, right. Things just happen. And when they open a door, it's usually a different room on the other side, even if it closes and they open it right away, right? Mm -hmm. Why yeah. don't they just sit by one door and keep tapping it? What's the point of actually moving? Right, if the goal is just to keep seeing other rooms... Open the door, close the door. Open the door, close the door. Open the door, close. Right, and maybe you'll find other people that way, and then they can either jump in your room or you jump in there. But yeah, but I, they have no strategy for solving the problem. Right. Yep. Other than let's look at this number, but it's only her looking at the number, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really seem to matter. When you find out the secret about Sasha that she's actually Alex, it it does nothing. You learn nothing more about the hypercube or, um. Or whatever, and even in the secret puzzle in the end, which is six fifty nine, is the point when the hypercube dissolves. First of all, who solves that? People keep writing it everywhere, but we're not entirely sure who figured it out. No, it's just no. a number out there. And when and she kind of figures it out in the last minute, and it just all it does is say at six fifty nine, jump into this hole. There's nowhere else to go at that point, so it's not exactly a. <laughs> stunning victory on the part of of this lady here yeah. so i think if you had a larger budget i i can't imagine like a 40 million dollar version of this would have such low stakes it would just the script would have to go through committee and you would get a script by committee but that at least would have stakes the characters would be doing things for a reason even if it was kind of cliched and the the thing with Sasha would be far more dramatic, even if it is a little, even if it would be hypothetically a bit high rolly. So I think a, probably a budget would have helped. I think yeah. you would have forced a better script. I agree. Um, and I imagine even in the script they had, they might have had more things they wanted to do that got cut. Um, I, this is 2003, so this is post Lord of the Rings. I also think if they're going to use that much CG, I think a bigger budget going into either more graphic designers that would have had more time to uh, build this or visualize the hypercube collapsing better, visualize um, some of the rooms smushing the people better. Um, I think that would have helped. And again, I, I imagine there was stuff they wanted to film that couldn't make it that would have mm -hmm. really helped the the film. Helped the experience, yeah. Yeah, I, I think maybe making it look better would have... Because that, that's kind of what it had going for it. Was the CGI? It was the visuals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we're saying sure. there were there weren't there wasn't a lot of tension in the puzzle solving. There wasn't a lot of tension in the character development. So it really was an aesthetic movie, is what 
is kind of why you're here. Mm-hmm. But well, what do you think, Tom? <laughs> Does it make the official recommend list? Well, if we're looking at the type of movie that goes onto this list, it's the type of movie that we can tend to find on this list. I don't think it's particularly good. Um, and I think the budget, if it is over a million dollars, hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm going to say no. How about that? No from Tom. It's a no from me. I think if you watch Cube, you don't need this one. I don't think it does anything that Cube didn't already do. So if Cube's on the list, if Cube's on the list and then you want to see the sequel, by all means, go check out Cube too. But I don't think we need it on the list because Cube is already there. Yeah. And the spinny camera work is so brutal. I don't know if I could recommend (laughs) Mm -hmm. somebody having to sit through that. Yeah, from the cinematographer of Pulp Fiction. Yeah, I I guess maybe he wanted to do a lot more with Pulp Fiction. Or was there a lot of spinny cameras in Pulp Fiction? I'm trying to remember. Um, There is some stylized camera work. You could think of the cab ride that Bruce Willis's character takes. It's kind of a stylized thing, but I don't remember any particularly spinny camera stuff (laughs) or camera like ups and down camera angles that indicate we're in zero gravity when we're not um yeah so well it's official cube 2 hypercube has not made the list hopefully we'll watch some more of sakula's movies and mm, hopefully sakula keeps making movies and maybe another entry will make it on the list what's your favorite movie by mr sakula You can rate and review this show anywhere fine podcasts are available. For those viewing in YouTube land, if you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the Talking Studios channel for all our exciting content, and follow us on social media at Talking Studios. Check out other shows by Talking Studios, including Talking Pictures Trivia, where we explore movies through trivia, Limited Lexicon, where we play through text-based adventure games, Get the Point, where we slowly reveal a movie poster and try to guess which movie poster it is, and Adapt It, where we explore adaptations in various forms. Got a question for us? Call the Talking Studios hotline at 201-467-8679 and leave a message. It may be featured on a future episode. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Keep Making Movies wherever fine podcasts are found. Join us next time when we discuss Alien Outposts from 2014. Stay tuned for our first impressions of Alien Outposts. Wow, Talking Studios. Next week, we'll be watching Alien Outpost. Tom, how was your watch? My watch occurred in my kitchen, I guess. I, it, it was, um, it's kind of a rough movie to get through, I would say. I think the director is the guy who took over Avatar The Last Airbender television show on Netflix. Oh, the I new think one. so. The new one, yes. I think so. I couldn't confirm if they were the same person. They both have the same name and work in VX. So my thought is they're the same person. But I'm not positive. But it's it's a movie. It's a movie that I, I don't really know what the point of it is. And it's also remarkable for how many guns they load but don't fire in a movie about firing guns <laughs> there's there is a lot of plot points that are you, set up you don't mean literal guns you mean no Chekhov's Chekhov guns, guns. yeah because <laughs> they fire a lot of guns in this they movie. fire a lot of literal guns but <laughs> Chekhovian guns they don't there's a lot of things that are set up that just and you're like okay what how is this going to be paid off and it it just never is paid off. They never get back to it, or the payoff is so slight that you either don't notice it or, or can't possibly care. And I'm not entirely sure what the... I mean, a movie doesn't have to have a point, but I'm not entirely sure with a movie like this if it doesn't have a point or it's 
point is muddied because it's pretty obviously linked to the Iraq war in some way. Well, we, we can get into it next week. If you yeah, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't have to go into any de depth now, but we, we can talk about that. How about you? How was your first first watch? What was your first impression? So my first watch was eight years ago, um, and I, I, I didn't realize it was that long ago. And what I remembered from the movie compared to this watch was a little bit different. Um, I forgot how bro -y it was. Audience, this is a very bro -y movie. My gosh. Um, it's in a military setting, so I guess that's kind of makes sense. It's also pretty anti-Islamic for no apparent reason, unless, like you're saying, maybe it's got something to do with the Iraq War. Um, so, audience, I don't know. I would check the trailer out before diving right in, maybe. Just make sure it's it's all right with... Uh, Spending an hour and a half or whatever is a long time to be, you know, shooting stuff, bro. Like, it's it's pretty bro-y. Um, Alien Outpost is available on AMC Plus at the time of this recording. I've never uh, I've never hit play on AMC Plus. <laughs> I did not know that was a, a thing, and I don't know why this is on there. <laughs> Great. I'm glad. 